Uh, well, thank you, R Richard. That's really kind. Um, Peter, you know, I'll tell you what he didn't say um, in his description of what's happened, and I'm going to just run over a few things that happened, but what he did when round about 30, 33, four years ago, changed what's happened in Birmingham uh, because he was part of a team that produced 15,000 hours, which was the first book and respectable piece of research which said, look, schools make more of a difference than people will acknowledge. He went on to write probably the best piece of research, School Matters, on primary schools, where, incidentally, Peter, I've scared heads rigid by telling them about the finding in that research, which shows that the heads are at the best between the third and the seventh year. You should pe see people collapse at that point. Um, and as Peter would be the first to say, that of course is a general rule, but there are exceptions. And incidentally, there's an exception in this school. An extraordinary woman, an extraordinary team. And incidentally, her deputy, um, who was teaching at Utree when I was here, I still dine out, not dine out, I still talk in workshops about what I saw in your deputy head teacher's classroom um, in U Tree when I was in Birmingham, an extraordinary teacher, and you've got an extraordinary head teacher, and by the look of it around this uh, school, you've got an extraordinary team uh, that produce amazing things. So, Peter, I want to thank, because don't forget, until that research came out, I was in the thrall of believing that intelligence was general, inherited, and mainly fixed, and all schools could do would optimise it. And yet, in the intervening years, just think of it, we've moved away from that view of intelligence, which dominated all our lives, into a view of intelligence promoted, I think, very strongly by Howard Gardner, among others in America, which is that there is multi-talent. And anybody not read a book that's just come out recently called Bounce by Matthew Side should have a go at reading it, because he says, and I think this school and schools in Birmingham really journey on that, which is if you can identify something youngsters are really enthusiastic about and you can get them alongside a really good coach and they really practice, they become amazingly good at whatever that activity is. And it so builds their confidence that it spills out into them saying, well, if, if I can do well at this... I can apply the same things to other bits of their learning and can take off in different ways. And incidentally, again, Peter's comments about the shortcomings of our uh, assessment system uh, underlines that because it focuses on a small number of skills and it believes that people should be making the same rate of progress. Have you ever, just think of your own children, have you ever seen children who make the same rate of progress? I and mean, they just don't. Uh, so there are flaws in the system we've got. I just wanted to rehearse very quickly. Um, so we've come a long way. We, we, we know differently about intelligence. We know far more about teaching and learning than we did, even when I, than I did when I came to Birmingham in the 90s. We learn more about it each year, and we apply it. Uh, and unsurprisingly, I think we have seen a rise in expectations and standards of outcome for youngsters, and we've still got a vibrant force of teachers in our schooling system and support staff who are making an enormous difference, and they're making a difference to these children on Friday, yesterday, they'll make it on Monday, and some of these children walk with genius. This school has the ability to unlock the mind in order to unlock that kid's talent, and they will be fulfilled and will fulfil others. So that's the purpose of what we're about. Now, the reason I'm here is it seems to me that we've lost our way over the last 30 years. Very quickly, when I set out, the Secretary of State had three powers only over education. The Secretary of State could determine the removal of air raid shelters, right, and could determine and was expected to secure a, a an adequate supply of suitably trained teachers and rationed school buildings in order that everybody had a fair deal. There were minimum standards that had to be observed and scarce 
resources for buildings were shared out in a way that was enormously important. Those were the three powers uh, that the Secretary of State had. Uh, he's now got 2,500 powers. So during that period, there has been an amazing centralisation of power, pursued firstly by the Conservative government in the 1980s, and then taken on by a Labour government and has been pursued further by the coalition. Though Mr Gove is an interesting character, because of those original three, clearly the air raid shelter doesn't really matter, right? Uh, at least at the moment. Uh, th the second one, securing an adequate supply of suitably trained teachers, I think does matter. I think it matters that somebody plans that at a national level. I've got to say the supply of teachers that we've got here is to do with people meticulously planning where training should take place. He's given that duty up. And uh, I'm very, very bothered about that because that's one power I think the Secretary of State should exercise, namely planning a supply of teachers. He's given it up and he's fragmenting the supply of teachers. I predict now that in three years' time, there'll be parts of the country where we have a severe shortage of teachers as initial teacher training places are taken away from the colleges, the universities, and handed over to where there happen to be schools that are teaching schools. Now, I don't, some of you will know about teaching schools. I was in Leeds the other day. They need, a, they need 100 new primary schools in the next 10 years, right? 100 new primary schools. That's a lot of schools, right? They have no capital building um, money. It's going to be run essentially by central government, who, by the way, thought they needed 10, right? That was the magnitude of the thing. And as I said to them, you do realise, don't you, you're not going to have any teachers. Why, they said. So I said, well, you know you rely heavily, and I named the colleges they rely on, I said, well, unless they're outstanding, they're going to be closed down, their courses of initial teacher training, and it's going to be handed over to teaching schools. I said, could you tell me how many teaching schools you've got in Leeds? Zero. Zero. So the, the, the real issue is going to be a shortage of teachers. But let's not get into future problems. Be but one of the issues is an over-centralisation of power uh, to the Secretary of State. That's one issue. Second issue would be up to, uh, and incidentally, between 1944 and 1980, there were no acts of education. None. Between 1980 and now, there have been over 40. Uh, and that has led to the centralisation of power. And teachers uniquely are told not only what to teach, but as those of you who are teaching in primary schools will know uh, from the synthetic synthetic phonics proposal, you are told how to teach it. Can you imagine a central government minister telling a brain surgeon how to perform a brain operation? I mean, it is unbelievable, the centralisation of power, the micromanagement at the centre, and the removal of respect and trust in the teaching profession. Now, I think that's serious really serious issue that we must address. Why has all this happened? Well, Peter was alluding to it. If you look at the white papers and the legislation from 1980 onwards, three words jump out of each white paper. Choice, diversity, and autonomy. Choice for parents, diversity of schools, and autonomy for schools. It also contains, i.e., applying market mechanisms to the provision of the schooling system. Compete, have league tables, inspect, say who's top, say who's bottom, of whatever the league table may be. On the other hand, every white paper also refers to equity and equality, i.e. it should be fair and there should be an equal chance for everyone. And yet, I've been wrestling all my life with the thought that there's a tension between these two. Markets produce success for those who are already successful, as Peter was saying, 
but they also reinforce failure for those who are in at least advantaged circumstances. So therefore, equity inequality, if you don't regulate the market or say, well, which bit of the market are we going to apply, you are going to damage the prospects for equity inequality. Now, it seems to me, and this is all I want to put forward this morning, is that has education got a moral purpose? And if it has... Have I got the moral compass? And I shall have an aside with Richard in a minute about moral compass, right? To my disadvantage, not his. And have you got moral courage to follow that moral compass? I think education has got moral purpose. I mean, you've only really got to... There was The, the one thing I remember was a beautiful piece of... Um, evidence to the, um, an, American, um, uh, an American commission into equality in education. And it's, uh, this is a black woman from the Deep South who gave this evidence to the commission in 1999. She said, I was meant to be a welfare statistic, but it is because of a teacher that I sit at this table giving evidence to you. I remember her telling us one day that she couldn't provide us with food she couldn't secure us with clothes, and she could do nothing about the terrible segregated conditions in which we lived. She could teach us to read. She could introduce us to the world of books. What a world! I visited Asia and Africa. I ran away with escaped slaves. I stood beside a teenage martyr. I saw lakes and sunsets, etc., I knew then that I wanted to do the same thing. I wanted to teach. I wanted to weave magic. Because she realised that a teacher and schooling had been the means of her escaping a form of what other people would describe as mental slavery. And that brings me to the second moral purpose, and forgive this one, but this is terribly important. I shall misquote it, but not badly, only because I can't remember precisely. Between 44 and 80, as I say, one act of Parliament. Butler, it's called the Butler Act. And Butler was profoundly affected by a religious leader, oddly enough, William Temple, Archbishop of Canterbury, sometime head teacher, sometime teacher, sometime leader of the Workers' Educational Association. And William Temple said... Listen to this. This is so important in my view. Are you going to treat a man as he is or as he might be? Forgive the male imagery, but it's 1940. Are you going to treat a man as he is, with many of his tastes warped, with his powers largely crushed? Or are you going to treat him as he might be, with many of his tastes Developed with his powers largely realised, right? So are you going to treat him as he is or as he might be? And he says, morality requires, I think, that you should treat him as he might be, as he has it in him to become. Business, the market, business, on the other hand, demands you should treat him as he is. And you cannot get rid of that strain except by raising what he is to the level of what he might be. And that's the whole work of education, schools and teachers. Until his powers are fully developed, he says you can't have a free society. You can't have political freedom. You can't have a person who can argue a case which is just. You know, shortly before I came to Birmingham, I'll tell you an incident. Right? which is in the late 80s. I opened the Daily Mail in the morning, and on the front page there is a picture of two youngsters in, Bur in London being put in the back of a police van at a demonstration in Trafalgar Square. Do you remember Scargill? Some of you will remember Scargill. And I look and I think, I recognise one of these youngsters, right? My son, right? In London. Right? He is being taken off with a kid who's bunked out of school from Doncaster from the age of 14, and they go before magistrates at different times, 
guess which, and he told me to leave it alone. He'll take care of it. Guess which one gets off and which one gets a suspended sentence. No prizes for guessing. The one that was taking their higher education seriously could argue a case which is just. The one who didn't, couldn't. And Temple ends by saying, there exists a mental form of slavery which is as real as any economic form and we're pledged to destroy it and that's why you have a schooling system and an education system. I think it is fantastic justification. And by the way, arguing, hey, I'm now saying, so teachers on Friday and on Monday in this school will treat children not as they infuriatingly are, but as they might become, won't they? Right? Amazing teachers doing that in their schools. Extraordinary. What other public service does that apply to? I am pushed, I'm not saying there are none, I am saying that the case for moral purpose in education and guarding against the marketplace is greater than it is in other public services. So, I think there are five tests, and I'll run through them ever so quickly, that we should insist that any future government, because I don't think I'm with Peter, not on the edge of Hansworth saying citizen action is the way to get change, right? You would understand why I might feel that. I think we've got to go through the democratic process. I think we've got to get politicians to adopt a commitment to understanding there's a different moral imperative in the running of education. So my five tests would be, number one, is it appropriate to apply market forces by this in, does this proposal affect the balance of market forces? And if market forces are being applied, is it proper that they should be? Because I quite accept, I think just about, that it is right that market forces have some sort of application in books and in the purchase of uh, everyday goods, because I think we've passed the time of believing that all those... So I don't mind about that. But I tell you what, I do not believe it is right that short-term shareholder profit is the goal of people who provide schools as a whole or teaching, when publicly provided, can do it so much better without the danger of short-term shareholder profit getting in the way of unlocking the mind and opening the shut chambers of the heart of these kids and their future. I cannot accept that. So I think that's number one question. Number two question, right, for me is, does the proposal devolve power from central democratic power to local democratic power? So the question would be, is this proposal going to move power away from the centre towards the edge, right? That my third proposition, uh, beyond those two, uh, would be, um, he says quickly, as I'm in the middle of uh, thinking through this, would this proposal increase or decrease the respect and trust in our teachers? Now, everything that applies to the curriculum and the assessment system has the power to do that or not to do that. We've chosen on every occasion not to do it. I think we should move into an era where there is a government committed to take every opportunity to reverse that trend. A fourth question, uh, which I, 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 would, uh, I would argue is uh, important, is what's the research evidence for what is being proposed. Now look, as Peter will know, the research evidence, he once worked for uh, an education authority where the education officer uh, used to say to him, I wish I could have a one-armed researcher. He was in charge of research. Because all you can simply do is tell me on the one hand the evidence is this, and on the other hand it is that. I mean, the fact is that that is the case. 
But for instance, if you could have a, a rule which is nothing should be adopted as public policy which say, without it saying, what does HMI said about this? What's the research evidence? And what's the House of Commons Select Committee say about this who will have conducted inquiries? So I hope uh, that uh, that would be uh, what we would manage to do. And my last point, if only I could read my own writing, uh, my last point is the most important of all, right? And perhaps it should be the first, which is, will this proposal improve the lot of those people, those pupils, those populations who've gained the least out of the schooling system in the past? We have made huge progress, particularly in this city, in understanding that. We were the first which had data which showed how children from different ethnic backgrounds were doing, how boys were doing, how girls were doing, how free school meals pupils were performing. I think we need any national proposal to ask that question. And many of Peter's preferred suggestions about uh, admission arrangements, etc., would help in that respect. Those are the five that I think are questions we should address nationally. Of course, locally, there will be similar five questions for Birmingham to address and for schools to address. Not necessarily the same, but analogous. And I think one of the things Case should do locally here is to work out some tests for local application as well. Thank you very much.